one of the reasons um, I've been a little bit more cautious on my statements throughout 2024 is because I'm not sure if liquidity is going to be really good or not this year. I do think that Bitcoin is likely to be relatively correlated with liquidity. It doesn't mean that, you know, on a week by week basis, it does what liquidity does, but it's, it's, you know, so, so far, at least in this, in the, you know, in the really, in the kind of first third of Bitcoin's life, it wasn't really correlated to anything because like if one doctor decided to buy Bitcoin that day, that just, that moved the price. It was small enough, you know, or if someone else sold, mm-hmm. that would move the price. But mm-hmm. ever since Bitcoin became big and liquid enough, kind of in the, in the second half of its life and really kind of the second two thirds like the, of its life, um, it's been it's had that correlation with liquidity. And one way to think about that is that when you're comparing the Bitcoin and dollar exchange rate, you you have to take into account what both of those monies are doing. So Bitcoin is the growing, harder, emergent money. The dollar is the big incumbent money. And, uh, it, you know, the dollar goes through periods of hardening and loosening on net. It's, it's kind of structurally loosening. That's what it does, but it goes through these kind of periods of hardening. Um, and so when it's doing that, it, it's pretty rare that Bitcoin is going to do well in that environment because it's getting pushed around by this, this bigger money that, you know, is, is the unit of account for much of the world. Lynn Alden's analysis highlights Bitcoin's evolving correlation with liquidity, especially as the cryptocurrency matures. Initially, Bitcoin's price movements were relatively independent of broader financial trends. However, as Bitcoin has grown in size and liquidity, its correlation with market liquidity has become more pronounced. This correlation is particularly relevant in 2024, a year that's shaping up to be pivotal for Bitcoin. The anticipated Bitcoin halving event expected in April is likely to impact Bitcoin's supply and demand dynamics significantly, potentially driving prices upwards. In addition to the halving event, the approval of Bitcoin ETFs by the SEC is expected to reshape the digital assets dynamics, bringing in more institutional involvement and potentially stabilizing the market. With these developments in mind, investors need to consider how Bitcoin's increased correlation with liquidity and these upcoming events might impact its price and market behavior in 2024. Before we delve deeper, remember to hit the subscribe button and give us a like if you find this video informative. I kind of have a very mixed outlook for liquidity this year, or at least the first half of the year. Um, and so I, I, whenever I, when people ask me what I think Bitcoin's going to do, I keep giving kind of a two-year view because I, I think I have better visibility on what happens in the two-year view. I think that liquidity is probably higher two years from now than it is now. But over the next six months or nine months or 12 months, I don't really have a firm view on that. Um, and, and so that's why I'm, I may be a little bit more cautious around my statements than a lot of other Bitcoin bulls are um, because nothing between $30,000 and $120,000 would surprise me because one is Bitcoin's that volatile and two, liquidity is that uncertain uh, in this calendar year, at least, at least in my opinion. And, mm-hmm. I, and I try to track liquidity pretty closely. Um, so you have, to, you, know, you have to take into account what is the dollar index going to do compared to other major currencies? What is China going to do? What is the Fed going to do? What is the Treasury going to do? Uh, what are banks going to do? Right. So there's there's you know there's multiple variables that feed into that. Um, so we've been in a liquidity consolidation for quite a while, and they, those can only last so long because the system is designed such that it always needs more liquidity. Uh, and so that's that plays into a lot of my view of why the next two years are probably going to have another up leg in liquidity. And we are off the highs in liquidity, which occurred back in late 2022. Um, so it's not that I think liquidity is going to be terrible. It's just I don't, I don't know if we're going to have like a big vertical move in liquidity, which if that were to happen, I think we'd get that big vertical move in, in Bitcoin most likely. But I don't know if that happens this year, next year maybe between the two years, some point. Um, and so that that's kind of how, and, and if you look at the halvings, I mean, the halvings are relevant for Bitcoin, but sometimes the bull run is like, you know, happens right around that time. Other, other times it's delayed for a period of time. Uh, and that's in large part because the actual timing tends to be more correlated with that liquidity component. Um, the halving plays a really big role in terms of, I think, why it has higher highs and higher lows. I think it plays a really big role in the bear markets like two years later, when not that many not that many people want Bitcoin anymore, uh, and there's there's still Bitcoin coming to market, but it's less because of the having um, that that helps set the higher floor. Uh, the kind of the hodlers of last resort have less supply to absorb. 
but in terms of timing around the having itself, I, I think the liquidity is, is you know, generally a bigger catalyst. Continuing with Lynn Alden's insights, her mixed outlook for liquidity in 2024 juxtaposes an uncertain short-term view with a more optimistic longer-term perspective. This approach is crucial for investors strategizing for both immediate and future market conditions. Alden's cautious stance reflects the unpredictable nature of liquidity, influenced by various global economic factors. The CBOE Digital's announcement to launch Bitcoin and Ether margin futures in 2024 aims to bolster liquidity in the cryptocurrency market. This move could significantly impact market dynamics, offering more robust trading opportunities and potentially enhancing Bitcoin's price stability. Moreover, the upcoming U.S. presidential election and the potential re-election of Donald Trump could also influence the market. Analysts suggest that a Trump presidency might boost the U.S. economy and, by extension, positively impact crypto prices. So there's monetary policy and fiscal policy. Um, and when the two go in opposite directions, usually fiscal policy wins, but it's not always a bumpy, it's not always a smooth ride. It can be very bumpy. And so monetary policy refers to basically what the Fed's doing or in, in another country, what, what that central bank is doing. And that basically is what are short-term interest rates set at because uh, it's, it's essentially controlled interest rates, uh, and then also balance sheet. What is what is the changing of base money doing? Because uh, that affects liquidity. Uh, so those are the two variables primarily that the central bank has to play with, whereas the fiscal side is more about how much is being taxed and where it's being taxed from and how much is being spent and where it's being spent and then specifically the delta between those two. So how large is the deficit and who primarily is receiving a lot of that deficit? Um, and they can go together. Like, for example, during the pandemic lockdown stimulus response, you had both. You had the, the fiscal authority spending a lot of money, but as they're issuing trillions of dollars of bonds – the Federal Reserve is creating new base money and buying a lot of those bonds. Uh, and so you're, you're printing money, but then you're also getting it out into the people's pockets. And so, but ever since we started to get inflation, the Fed's been tightening up. So they're saying, okay, we're raising interest rates and we are uh, reducing our balance sheet. But the fiscal side is still, you know, they're not doing like stimulus checks anymore, but they're still running a structural, largely demographics driven deficit. And what makes it complicated is that as the Fed raises rates, it loses the fiscal side even more because it raises their interest expense. And someone, someone out there is receiving that money. You know, it could be the foreign sector, it could be banks, it could be insurance companies, it could be uh, upper middle class or wealthy people that have a lot of cash. Austin awesome money, money markets. markets. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. So people are receiving that money, um, and that that has some prop propensity to be spent. It's not as rapidly spent as stimulus checks. Uh, tend to be, but it, it is income to, to various entities that can go out and, and spend it. Uh, and so the, the way that I keep describing that is, so back in the 70s, you know, like money creation comes from two sources, either that monetized fiscal deficits or bank lending. And the central bank, the monetary policy is mostly designed around controlling bank lending. So things that encourage them to lend more or things that encourage them to lend less. Uh, or the other way around, people to borrow more or, or borrow less. Um, and so in the 70s, most of the inflationary money creation we had, the majority of it was from bank lending. And that was in large part because the baby boomers were entering home buying years. Um, so there's a lot of demand for credit and there was a lot of provision of credit. And so you had a lot of broad money supply growth at a time when we also had you know, we were, we were running fiscal deficits. We also had oil shortages, things like that. But the biggest component was that money creation the lending. Uh, we had very low public debt to GDP. Uh, and so when the central bank raised rates very high, you know, kind of the classic Volcker, you know, the well-known historic Volcker moment, um, that put a big break on bank lending. And although it did increase the fiscal deficit because it increased the interest expense of the government, it was less, the, 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 the downward push on banks was bigger than the upward push on the government because the government debt was so low. So if you raise interest expense on 30% debt to GDP, that's only so impactful. Whereas if most of the money creation is coming from bank lending and you, and you kind of right. slow that down, that, that, the monetary side is winning there. On the other hand, if you fast forward 40 years and now debt is 130% debt to GDP, when the, when the central bank raises rates, on one hand, they do slow down the bank lending. We've seen that in the data. Bank lending is kind of at stall speed right now. It's, it's very slow. Uh, but – 
now there's just more and more interest expense pouring out into the economy from the government. And so that magnitude is roughly equal, right? So so kind of the slowdown in bank lending is roughly equal to the increase in interest expense. Um, and if you fast forward even further, do you get to like a J- Japan situation? Uh, if they raise rates, it'd probably be outright pro- pro-inflationary because the fiscal side would be actually so much bigger than the loan mm. side, whereas we're more in that middle range right now, which is partially why their tools are not as effective. Um, and that that kind of is the hallmark of an end of a major cycle, like a long-term debt cycle. So, you know, in this kind of 50-year feed experiment that we've had, uh, you know, we had a de- the, the 70s were unstable, right? Because people are trying to come to terms with this new system. Uh, then they kind of stabilize it in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and then you had kind of two years of, you know, stock market bull run, uh, kind of just very stable situation. But then that ended with the dot-com bubble. It all kind of blew up into this giant equity bubble. It started to all kind of fall back down. Uh, then you started to get stimulus to kind of re-stimulate things, and it kind of pushed up a big housing bubble. And then that started to kind of unravel, and that kind of hit the core banking system. And then they kind of pushed it up to the sovereign level, right? So e- each one's kind of like you can picture like a fish getting eaten by a bigger fish, mm-hmm. eaten by a bigger fish. And now it's now it's the whale. Now it's like it's it's all the way towards the top. It's at the sovereign debt level and the currency level, um, and so that's where you kind of hit the end of the road in terms of places to push it up. Uh, but you're not end of the road. You're not at the end of the road in terms of like the the consequences of having pushed it up that mm-hmm. far. That can play out for a period of time. And so right now, I think we're at the stage where there's just higher background fiscal deficits, which on one hand can be stimulatory, uh, especially if you're on the right side of them. Uh, but on the other hand, that's a, that can be a higher background level of inflation that's pushing up against the various disinflationary forces we have, like AI and tech in general and, and things like that. We have this ongoing background fiscal push, and the central bank can't do anything about it. Um, you know, They can try to push back a little bit, but they can't really do much about it. Uh, and to the most part, what they can do is slow down bank lending so at least you don't have both happening at the same time. But again, you can only do that for so long. Um, and so I think that that's kind of the dilemma they face right now. And right now it's fiscal that's in charge. In 2024, we are witnessing an economic scenario where central banks are tightening monetary policies to combat inflation, while governments continue to run high fiscal deficits. This tug of war effect is influencing not just traditional markets, but also the cryptocurrency space. The global liquidity index, which captures the global liquidity cycle, suggests that we are nearing the top of the next cycle expected around Q4 2025. This cycle is closely tied to Bitcoin's price movements and could signal a significant period for Bitcoin investors. Furthermore, the rising interest from institutional investors, as indicated by the rising trend in the GMI Total Liquidity Index, suggests that more funds are allocating larger portions of their portfolios to Bitcoin. This institutional interest could lead to increased market stability and higher Bitcoin prices, potentially pushing Bitcoin to new heights. This concludes our analysis of Lynn Alden's views on Bitcoin, liquidity, and the interplay of fiscal and monetary policies. As we navigate these complex dynamics, it's essential to stay informed and adaptive to the evolving market conditions. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto. If you found this video insightful, please like, subscribe, and share it with others. Stay tuned for more in-depth cryptocurrency analysis and updates.